communists know that the only way to take over a country is to collapse the nuclear family. And you're watching it happen in real time. And you're watching the results of the collapse of the nuclear family happen in real time. At the end of this, it will be the element of spirituality that people will be desperately seeking because there will be nothing else. There will be nothing else for them to, to do, say, go. That will be the rock bottom, and that's what we will see. They will want a miracle. Welcome to the Staying Free Podcast. In this episode, I spoke with Liz Churchill. Many of you are going to know Liz already. She's got a massive Twitter account. She's become a huge voice in the freedom community, and I was super excited to get her on the podcast to share some of her views in a different format. We talk about a bunch of different things in this episode, everything from Canadian politics to censorship to voting, and we spent quite a lot of time talking about Liz's hair as well. (laughs) Anyway, I really like the fact that Liz just says it as it is, and this is something I've noticed quite a lot with women in the freedom community. They really don't hold back, and Liz was another great example of someone who is very unapologetic for her advocacy for freedom and traditional values. I hope you enjoy the episode. If you do, please give it a like and a share. If you're enjoying the podcast so far, please give it a five-star review in whichever podcast app you're using and make sure you subscribe for future episodes. As always, there's two ways you can help support the show. The first is via Bitcoin tips, which you can follow the link on the Twitter page or the address in the description, which I'll try to remember to put in there after recording this intro. And that's possible via both Bitcoin main chain and Lightning Network. And the other option is to follow the link in the description to buy me a coffee where you can give a fiat donation as well. All tips are hugely appreciated and will go directly towards the cost of running the show. Thanks so much to everyone who is listening and who has subscribed. I really hope you're enjoying the podcast. And if you have any feedback, please let me know. I'm always looking to try and improve the show. All right, let's get into the episode. I was actually going to ask you this. How's the eyes? Oh, it's great. Um, So I had to have surgery because I have this condition that my dad has. And it's just, it's not, it's it's a nuisance condition. And it just, you grow, it's like, it's called eczema lasma. And so anyways, to get it removed, your eyes get so bruisy. And it would look like I was in a bar fight or just released from prison. And then at that point... You would be like, wow, okay, you'd get a ton of messages and they'd be like, what happened to her? Is she okay? And it just looks a lot worse than how it feels. That's all it is. Okay, because it's been a couple of weeks, right, since you had the surgery. Yeah, yeah. And the thing is, your eyes are black. It's like they're they're bruised. Like I had black eyes. Yeah, yeah. And we all know it takes a long time for that to go away. Well, you did send me the picture of it, and um, oh, yeah. yeah, it looked it looked bad. I can I can confirm it, it, it looked bad, so I can understand why you didn't want to do um yeah. why yeah. you didn't want to do yeah. uh, video. But that's that's fine. That's yeah. fine. We can do we can do I audio. I could have done it with sunglasses. You know, next time I can do it with sunglasses, and that would be okay. I should have thought of that to begin with, but uh, whatever. It is oh, what you it could is. have gone like full freedom fighter and put the anonymous mask on. Oh. There you go. Actually, Two yeah, birds with one great stone. Idea. You know, I'm so anti mask that anything on my face, it drives me crazy. And even when I see people masked outside, and I just did not too long ago, uh, I just want to stop and say, wow, like, why? Why? Why are you still doing this? And it just, it's amazing. It's amazing. I wonder when like everyone's told to to take their mask off because, you know, they want to catch everyone on CCTV and all of this kind of like facial recognition stuff. I wonder whether these people will become uh, unlikely allies, the people right. who, have, who, are, who, are, who are still really on the masking thing. Right. Well, I actually think that these would be the people that would be the first in line for a global digital ID because that way you don't actually have to do anything but have your phone you can be masked all you want and you just have to have that specific card or that up or that upc code or whatever it is on your phone or that chip in your hand and you're good to go you don't even need to show anyone who you are yeah right i guess uh that's the end that's goal. where we're going right yeah that's the end goal Anyway, welcome to the podcast. I actually thought I was going to be the first person to get Liz Churchill on my podcast. And then um, it turned out, I just found out today, you were on uh, Rick Munn's podcast the other day. 
I was, yes. Yes, yes, yeah. I was. Yes. So he beat me to it, but that's awesome. So I, I do know a little bit about your your background and I recommend that people go and check out that conversation as well. But just in terms of your your background for the sake of my podcast, do you mind giving just a little brief uh, brief introduction as to yourself and how you became um, caught up in this whole freedom movement? Well, basically, um, to make a long story short, I'll tell you that over a year ago, I met with some people in the basement of my parents' church. And they said to me that something was happening and we all knew something wrong was happening. And with the Emergencies Act being put in place and the closing of the churches, nothing made sense whatsoever. And I met with some politicians, doctors, lawyers, etc., and they presented to me some evidence that um, what was happening uh, with, with the circumstances globally was, um, there was more to the story and, and it ended up being that everything was quite calculated and put into place in, in a very specific way through very specific agencies and had all the specific governmental agencies and politicians lined up and ready to go to implement, um, what we knew as the first lockdown, and at that time, we knew that it was going to be a revolving door. So with saying that, we knew that it wasn't going to end. So we had to put something into place to raise awareness um, of the things that we were doing behind the scenes without saying exactly what we were doing behind the scenes, but to spread the word. So that's um, when I was asked to uh, create a social media, not page because I'm pretty much banned everywhere, but to amplify what I was already doing and, yeah. and to um, disseminate information that none of the establishment media was going to um, give the public because they're complicit too. And now three years later, we're, we're actually, no, I said a year ago, I'm so sorry, time flies. So it's two years ago now. And so yeah. basically there was a group of us that were, we were told, you know, get the information out and we'll just play it by ear in regards to what you can do next. And so that's what I did. And, you know, you create a character on Twitter to give out important life-saving information while trying to dodge the algorithms and certain words that they will use to completely suspend you. And I've been successful so far. <laughs> yeah, well, <You> know? <laughs> that's great that you have because I, I just tweeted today or yesterday, like I, I'm beginning to forget what the retweet button looks like because so many people I'm following have their accounts mm -hmm. locked that the, the retweet oh, yes, button isn't available and you've amazingly managed to um slip through that net so congrats i i don't even i don't know like you know it's 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 like this it's like this we're in a battlefield right now and this type of war that we're in and i always refer to it as asymmetrical war because it's coming at us in a multi different it's, it's coming at us in different directions and a lot of it is subtle a lot of people don't understand what's going on and the purpose of it is to create that element of confusion so people comply mm -hmm. right and that's exactly what we saw and with the heavy mass formation psychosis and the masterful psychological warfare that was forced on this world for the past three years I, you know, I believe that the censorship and the collusion with establishment media has made the task of people like us trying to get out and tell the truth and dodge said bullets because it's one big cyber battlefield. And unfortunately, you know, like it's, it's just a matter of time before I'm suspended. They, they can go back like three years and, and find something that they can deem offensive or some copyright or whatever. And I'm done. That's it. Right. Totally. Yeah. I mean, um, that's a great term that you use just there, the digital battlefield. It definitely is like that. And one of the reasons that I really like podcasts as an alternate form, one of the reasons that I kind of 
you know, I think that podcasts are hugely important in this fight is because the way they work, I don't know if you know too much about it, but basically you have like a kind of RSS feed, like you have your, your host, which hosts all your episodes. And then all of these kind of other podcast services, you know, these platforms and stuff, they basically just, just pull your content from there. So yeah. if, you know, Apple decides to pull you, it's just Apple pulling you. It's not like you're hosting your, your podcast on the, on their uh-huh. servers, uh-huh. likewise, Spotify, et cetera. And I, I, what I want to see, and maybe this exists is a, a platform whereby it works the same for like tweets, right? So it's yes. almost like a kind of, you, you can host it and you can even self-host it, or you can choose between a multitude of hosts who are all incentivized not to censor you because that's how, you know, right. um, they, they, yes. they get you yes. as a customer, et cetera. And that you can have platforms. So you could use Twitter or you could use any other number of apps for, you know, your social feed and it pulls from your feed, which can be hosted anywhere and which is kind of like much more open. Uh-huh. I'd love to see something like that. I mean, it's still, you know, going to be, I think Twitter is, is, is ultimately going to destroy themselves. Like I think that, they are going to do yes. that because the whole point is that this is the the kind of global water cooler, right? That this is the place where yeah. everyone goes to to have conversations and to yes, it's the town square. It really is the town square. Yeah, so they're, right? they're essentially kind of killing their their golden goose here, right? Like ultimately, they're gonna they're gonna censor themselves so much that they just become irrelevant. And I actually think they're okay with that. I think that they're at peace with this. I think that they're all just like, well, you know, if we destroy our company. Um, in the process of of censoring everyone's ideas, then that's okay because that's still a better situation than people just having open and free speech. Because from their point of view, because they're kind of you know some kind of um, communist ideology that seems to run rampant in all of these tech right. firms, is that they just believe right. that yes. if people have free speech, it's going to end up in some kind of far right dystopia, according to to their ideas, right? Like, so I think that they will do anything, um, you know, including kill their own their own company in order to. Oh, absolutely. To Yes, like these communist organizations are designed to self-implode. Right. That's all yeah. it is. Yes. Yes. And they are all communists. You are correct when you say that. They're communists. And these communists, they must use their weapon of censorship because their ideas are so insane that you would have to be you would have to use censorship because using open dialogue and debating their ideas in a fair bipartisan manner would never happen. Yeah. Never. Yeah. No. You're just completely shut down. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, you know, I'm glad to see that, you know, we have new platforms springing up, you know, things like Odyssey. The one that I think is going to go first, the one that I think is going to become irrelevant first which is actually one of the biggest ones, which is YouTube. And the reason I think that oh, YouTube yes. is going to go first is because it, YouTube doesn't depend so much on network effects. So, like, if you've got a YouTube channel, Right. You don't really, yes. for instance, with your Twitter, you build up all of these followers and stuff like that. Of course, yes. that, that happens That that happens as well with YouTube. But I just feel like people would be willing to switch platform as a user, right? Like as a user, if, if your favorite content creator on YouTube, if they go to Odyssey and say, I'm no longer using YouTube. For you, it's just, I sign up on a new account and I follow that that thing, right? It's not That's like right. if they've gone over to a new thing like Getter or whatever, where you're like, okay, well, only you've gone there. I need all of my follow, all the people I'm following to go there for it to be worthwhile me moving. Uh-huh. Whereas with YouTube, even if just one of your, you know, normally you're, you're only sub to what, maybe five, maybe 10 people on there. So if one yes. person goes over it that's already enough incentivization you know that maybe that's like 10 percent of of all you're viewing you're like okay well, cool I'll, I'll you know spin up an odyssey account or whatever so i just think that youtube doesn't have the same like degree of network effects weighing them down so much i think that people will will fly from that platform a bit easier i think that they're in a position right now where they would have to completely reinvent themselves to save themselves but again once captured by the communist entity that makes that project impossible to do so i mean it's like it's it's become like a bad restaurant you know and yes i think and i think that the only hope would like i said would be to reinvent themselves but i i really don't see it happening and there are much more positive platforms like you just mentioned that don't have that tyrannical boot on everybody's neck every time they post something yeah, exactly. I mean, the way that I'm getting around YouTube at the moment, because I'm currently kind of uploading my back catalog to YouTube, but I recognize that oh, if okay. I just uploaded it as is, that it's just going to get taken down. So my um, my approach, and if people are listening to this on YouTube, then they'll, they'll know this already, is that every time, uh, you know, we talk about the vaccine or something like that, or 
you know, alternative treatments, et cetera. I just put, yeah. I just have a censorship, like a blanket censorship message that just goes across that whole section, which just says, oh, yeah. this, this section of the conversation has been censored. Um, you know, go over to a, a censorship free platform to listen to the full unedited episode. And I think that that's my way of kind of just essentially kind of giving the middle finger to these, these platforms. And I actually think that, you know, not that they care enough about my podcast <laughs> at this stage, but like, it, right. If it was if it was really big enough for them to care, they might even just kick me off for that. Because I, you know, with these organizations, it is just a constant slippery slope. Like once you start censoring, you know, it, right. where does it right. end? Right. So even putting in a censorship message to say, look, I'm not talking about things that I'm censored. I'm just explaining to people it's been censored. I think that at some point they'll throw you off for, even for that, <laughs> which is, you know, I guess we'll find out down the line. I don't know anyone else who's taken that approach, but that's that's certainly well, what I'm speaking doing. Of, speaking of which, the World Economic Forums stated that they're looking for to hire disinformation warriors and i posted about that earlier it's so ridiculous to hire disinformation <laughs> warriors what does that yes. mean well they want to hire um here i'm gonna re- i'm gonna read their uh thing that i posted earlier and this was from Neil Ferguson's calculator and <laughs> Love it. the World Economic Forum announces recruitment of information warriors to control the narrative on social media. Oh, so so they basically Can want you imagine? they basically want they're calling them information warriors, but they don't want to hire quote unquote disinformation warriors and just say, look, no, we're gonna, sorry, yes, we're yes, turn yes. You around. They're, they're hiring information warriors to fight disinformation. Yes, yes, yes. In their in their terms, but obviously it will be as with all these things the exact opposite of everything they say yes so i suspect that they know that everyone knows who they are now and they are trying to this is we're going into full-blown damage control right now oh yeah oh yeah i think think we've been there for a while (laughs) yeah they're getting desperate and You know, like these are the people that were supposed to be quietly working behind the scenes, the overlords, the people making all of the decisions that nobody was supposed to know about. This section of the conversation has been censored in order to meet the community guidelines. For the full uncensored version of this conversation, please check the description for links to censorship-free platforms. Yeah, it's, it's very, very strange. And, you know, is that information public in terms of which ones actually are the young leaders? you just go onto their website it's all right there they admit it yeah but th- because i remember seeing a video clip at one point where klaus schwab even said that vladimir putin was a, yes. a member but i couldn't find anything about that so it's like did he just bullshit us all or or is there people who I, are no no so no so putin was at one point i don't know the full story in regards to his full membership right now right. i suspect that he's a rogue member so he was a member. I don't, I think he became disenfranchised with what they were doing at the time. And we're talking, you know, Putin, he's a thug. He's, I'm not, I'm not going mm-hmm. to praise him or, you know, give him positive feedback. But I believe he just said, no way, I'm not, I'm not doing this. And that's it. But then you look on the flip side and he's working with China, who is a gold standard member of the World Economic Forum. And they're um, working with some project regards to digital currency or digital um, IDs. I'm I'm uncertain what the full story is because you can't trust anything that comes out of um, communist China. Yeah, I'm glad that you you have a kind of high degree of well, not just skepticism, but yeah, you kind of recognize that about Putin oh, yeah. because I think I think one of the problems oh, yes. Yes. of what's happened recently in the freedom community is that a lot of people have been so quick to to kind of just invent these narratives about Putin somehow being a good guy, and it just is always such no. a stretch when I see it. It's like, oh, Putin is no. you know Putin is is has declared war on WEF and stuff, and I'm like what are you talking about? No. Like, where have you got this from? No. I feel like a lot of people have just taken no. their contrarianism yeah. to a, to a ridiculous degree and kind of invented, you know, narratives that just don't exist. Cause I just think there's no heroes in this ultimately. Right. So the best way to describe what you just said to me was we need to look at why people are doing this. 
So during a time where the populace is extremely demoralized, people are looking for a savior. And this is, again, if we look historically, how did Hitler come into power, right? It's the exact same thing. And people are, we're at a time where people are looking for a strong leader to save them. And that's not the case here because I think people do know that to some extent, pretty much every single politician is compromised, right? Yeah. So they're looking for that rogue person that's dissenting from the narrative. And when you look at Putin, the best way to describe him would be to explain that he's the best person in the mafia. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? He's still a bad guy, but he might be one of the better bad guys. And that's it. Yeah, I think that also it's just that people look at everyone who's kind of come to the defense of, of Ukraine, whether that's on an individual level, you know, the people who put the you know, the flag in their bio and stuff like that, or whether it's on the, oh, on the political level. And, and I think that people see that and they, they see these people kind of, you know, sticking up for, for Ukraine so much and they immediately say, okay, well, they're my enemy or or whatever. And therefore the enemy of my enemy is my friend. And I think, I think yeah. ultimately it's just like, that is not, you know, th- there's no way that I can see from everything that, that's going on with Putin right. that I, I just can't see any possible way that, that this is someone that we should in any way trust or think is a good guy. I think that that is, um, yeah, it's a shame to see because I think it's kind of split people on the on the on the on the side of freedom in this whole well, thing. But the problem is again, people don't understand or know the history, right? So if we knew the history, then then we would have a completely different perspective. Like, for example, it the the, the reality is that Putin is fighting NATO and the CIA. Like we we know that, right? 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 And and. At the end of the day, this has been an ongoing issue for many years. This section of the conversation has been censored in order to meet the community guidelines. For the full uncensored version of this conversation, please check the description for links to censorship-free platforms. Oliver Stone, I, I believe, made, made, made a film about it. Oh, I haven't seen that. Oh, yes. Ukraine is the money laundering capital of the world. Yeah, I've heard a lot about this. I just haven't put it, you know, for me, it's just, yes. it's kind of a, a can of worms that I've just not opened, not because, you know, in any way that I, I don't want to know. It's just like, there's so much going there's, on in the world. It's hard it's to- It's so geopolitical. Yes. This is what is called geopolitics. And nobody seems to understand the geopolitical specter. And until you do, then everything else makes sense because you're watching an illusion. This section of the conversation has been censored in order to meet the community guidelines. For the full uncensored version of this conversation, please check the description for links to censorship-free platforms. And I think you need to ask yourself, if, if, if voting really mattered, if it truly did, would they let us do it? Well, yeah, I mean, um, the thing is that when the media is so controlled, I genuinely think, because I don't, I mean, for instance, with um, Trump losing the election and stuff like... This section of the conversation has been censored in order to meet the community guidelines. For the full uncensored version of this conversation, please check the description for links to censorship-free platforms. In my view, they don't need to steal an election because the media ensures the result anyway. So it's kind of inconsequential for me. That's right. That's right. So before the 2020 election in the States, there was an article written And I remember it very clearly. And it stated that it doesn't matter who wins the election because the media will decide who wins. And that that that's exactly what happened. Right. Yeah. I mean, the thing with with Trump, though, is that I think that they knew that they couldn't they couldn't use those same tried old tactics, because I think what they probably tried to do is they expected in 2016 Trump was never going to win. They were like, okay, well, we're going to ensure that he doesn't win through the media. And then when he won, they were like, okay, it's not going to work this time. We need to actually go in harder. This section of the conversation has been censored in order to meet the community guidelines. For the full uncensored version of this conversation, please check the description for links to censorship-free platforms. I tell everyone to please watch Amanda Milius's film, The Plot Against the President. This oh, okay. film, I, I believe, will be shown in high schools and schools around the world because it explains everything from an evidence standpoint featuring real life people that explained exactly what happened with the Russian hoax and the election of um, 2016. 
this section of the conversation has been censored in order to meet the community guidelines. For the full uncensored version of this conversation, please check the description for links to censorship-free platforms. Right? Yeah, I love I love how that whole thing just turned out to be a complete nothing burger and no one apologized. It was just like, oh yeah, we've just spent four years or five years talking about this and you know, now we'll just right, move on. But again, and we go back to Goebbels in 1940s and he clearly states, you repeat a lie often enough and people will believe it. And yeah, yeah. that's exactly what they did, right? Goebbels used PA speakers in the streets. Uh, the Clinton cartel used their media empire, and that's yeah. it. The the documentary, by the way, that I meant that I forgot the name of before. It's called Two Thousand Mules. Oh yes, I've seen this as well. Yes, yes. This section of the conversation has been censored in order to meet the community guidelines. For the full uncensored version of this conversation, please check the description for links to censorship-free platforms. One side has been infiltrated by the other side, right? That's how they do it. What do you mean one side has been infiltrated by the other side? Okay, so we have, okay, so let's take the United States as an example. So we have Democrats and Republicans. So what has happened is we have Democrats that are elected Republicans. They're posing as Republicans, but they're Democrats. They call them Republicans in name only. And that's part of the problem here. But wasn't Trump one of those? It wasn't Trump a Democrat before? I might be wrong about that. Yes, he was, I believe. And I mean, he played both sides for decades, mm -hmm. right? So he would donate to left wing organizations and then he'd donate to the very opposite uh, cause in a life in a right wing organization. Yeah. So, I yeah. mean, he did, he really did play both sides. And yeah, he was a Democrat, but now, like, he, clearly he has proven that that is not the case. And we can also look at people like General Michael Flynn, who was a lifelong Democrat, who is a Republican. And I mean, the problem with the Republicans, I believe in the states, is that they, the Democrats are all vote and side together. There's unison in that entire party. There's no dissenters. But we look at the Republican Party and half of that party votes with the Democrats. Oh, do they? Yes. Most of the time, oh, yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So that's what we call like a communist infiltration. Yeah. I mean, um, it makes sense, right? I think that's that's happening in many different areas, not just politics, but in, in so many different institutions. Yeah, in Canada. So in Canada, it's the same thing. The liberals versus the conservatives. So we have the liberals that that stick together at all costs, that are thick as thieves, and we have the conservative party who votes half the time with the liberals. Yeah, I, actually thinking about it, that's basically very similar to to the UK as well. Like when, yes, when we have everywhere. a critical vote on um on like vaccine passports, like that's right. Yeah, half actually it was all of the opposition I think voted in favor, yes. and half of the um half of the, the people in power didn't it was, uh, it was all a bit a bit crazy but um yeah on that note of politics actually what's the politics like in Canada I don't really know much about it do you mind just giving a bit of a, a kind of overview of what 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 the the two parties are about and how they're all kind of you know acting in these current times so in Canada we have several parties similar to your country the primary parties are Liberal, Conservative, and New Democrats Party. And as we speak, the Liberals formed a party with the New Democrats to try and form a government that would make their administration last another three years. And then we have the Conservatives that vote with the Liberals half the time. So, for example, the leader of Ontario is Doug Ford. and he is supposed to be a conservative. However, he will travel around the country with liberal tr Justin Trudeau and you'll see them smiling and hugging and shaking hands. And he votes in line with Justin Trudeau. So then a lot, so, so then we start, so over the past few years, you know, I was happy to see that people started to realize, okay, like we're voting for these conservatives, but they, they're not presenting conservative values. Like what is happening? And that's not happening on the liberal side and so that's true yeah again it is what i call a communist infiltration so what they do is the communists infiltrate the conservative party to ensure that the communist narrative 
keeps going. So it can bounce back from party to party to party to party. There's only one party in Canada, the People's Party of Canada, that was against every mandate, against every everything. And they were not allowed to debate. They were not allowed any media airtime. They're not allowed to speak uh, about, uh, I forget what it was. Uh, the leader, uh, Maxine Bernier, was arrested in a field um, doing a rally I think it was a year ago, um, asking, you know, followers to come and speak and have a meet and greet. And I, he was arrested. He was also arrested on the highway. Um, so, I mean, I think that people really need to focus on who are the people that establish, establishment media has completely censored. Who are the people that spoke out against every mandate? Those are the people that we need to start paying attention to because every Everybody else, everybody else is compromised. Yeah, yeah. That's, um, yeah, I had heard of Maxine Bernier. I don't know, don't know too much. It's a him, right? Maxine Bernier. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. I, I don't know too much about him, but um, yeah, I need to, I need to find out a little bit more. So actually, do you mind if I just stop the recording at this point? Sure. It might, seems like a good point to segue and then I'll fire sure. up another to continue because yeah, we've got like sure. five minutes left, so... All right, cool. Sure, I'll, sure, sure. I'll shoot you a link in like one minute. Sure. Hello again. Hey, yeah, that was, that was actually relatively painless. It's actually kind of nice doing this again on um, on Zoom. I used to do them all over Zoom, but I moved over because I started doing video and stuff. But it's nice just having the simplicity of this, to be honest. I promise I'll do a video when in, in a few months when my face is completely healed because even right now um my eyes like i they don't even look like my eyes did like a month ago i i don't even look like the same person right now so it's just like one of those vanity things i think i need to sit out for a bit but i promise i will do video when i'm able to that's great i'm glad i'm glad you said that because you've got the um the best hair in the freedom community that's official mm -hmm. oh my gosh i'm gonna send you a picture of my my hair the way it is right now like it looks like i've been attacked by like 20 cats is this going to include your uh your bruised, bruised eyes? eyes yes i can't promise that i'm not going to use it as a thumbnail photo <laughs> <laughs> i don't i honestly don't care you know, some well uh, to be fair like the the pictures i posted recently i i filtered out all of the the, the bad parts because i just don't want people I, my my inbox would be like are you okay are you what happened, you know, yeah. and I just don't want to explain it. So anyways, yeah, my hair is a, is a big mess. Like it's beyond <laughs> crazy. You know, it's like, it's electrified, like it, you know, it's, it's long, it's, it's crazy. And yeah, it's always been that way. You know, I actually, 10 years ago, I had a pixie cut because my hair. I don't was even know what that is. What's a pixie cut? A pixie cut is where your hair is literally almost shaved off. Oh. Very, very short. Oh, okay. it was My hair was only an inch long. I looked like a little fairy. And... Uh, <laughs> oh, wow. So you really went from one extreme to the other. <laughs> I've had it all. I've had, I've had medium. I've had long. I've had short, short. I've had red hair, blonde hair, dark brown hair. I've had it all. This is my nat my naturalish color right now. The blonde I have is, is really what should be like whitish but um yeah no this is my natural color and i just i wear it to be honest with you i wear it up a lot because it's so heavy you know uh, okay yeah because um yeah. because i i only really know you from your from your twitter photo and i always i yeah. always know when it's you tweeting because it's just like this mass of really awesome hair there in that photo so uh i always <laughs> assume that that's exactly how you look in real life with just like perfect oh hair. yeah like if you well, in, no, in real life, you would see me and my hair is up in a ponytail and I'm wearing jogging pants and a t-shirt and sunglasses. Okay. Well, you, you, you're killing the il illusion for everyone. So, I'm sorry. Uh... That's, re I'm sorry. That's <laughs> reality. You know, I'm so sorry, but like, I'm really such a plain Jane, you know, like, again, when you take a picture, you, t you have to take like 500 and then choose the best one, you know, like most of my pictures, because you're very, my you're very honest. Well, most of my pictures, I, I will be honest with you, most of my pictures, my eyes are closed because my eyes are so sensitive to light. And I usually have one eye open or not the other eye open. Or if I sleep on one side, I'll put my hair on the one eye that looks larger than the other because I look ridiculous. 
and yeah, no, not every picture is, 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 is glamorous. That's for, that's for sure. That's for sure. I have to say though, when you sent me the picture to show you the aftermath of your eye surgery, your hair was yeah. exactly like it was in your profile picture. So I was like, Oh, it, it's true. She always looks like this. No, I ju- actually, I just had got out of the shower and I blow dried my hair and I used a blow dry brush. I have three different blow dryers I use on my hair to dry it. And for about an hour, three after, different blow dryers. Yes. And I'll send you a picture. You'll laugh. And <laughs> it's really nice for about an hour after I dry it. But then that's when the humidity starts to kick in and then it starts to get frizzy. And then I turn into an electrocuted human, yeah. you know, like there's no way around it. Yes. So I obviously caught you then in that hour long window of perfect hair. I would only send a perfect picture because I like, why not? <laughs> I guess. <laughs> like, okay. you know, like, well, anyway, unless you decide to, to post a picture in your post eye surgery uh, state, then this conversation is going to be relatively meaningless to people. So let's get back to the true. politics stuff. True, true, true. So yeah, before we, before we, um, had to stop the recording we were talking sure. about like canadian politics and stuff yes 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 and um I-, I haven't really had a conversation with anyone from canada about the truckers protests like everything that i've seen oh, okay i feel has been kind of from an outsider's perspective because it's just been like me seeing videos and pictures on twitter mm-hmm. obviously i didn't see anything in the news but i don't watch the news anyway so i wouldn't even have a have a clue how they're right. reporting it but i'm assuming that they said that everyone was you know a racist bigot or whatever yes yes yes. so was it like in canada w- were you able to kind of like partake in it in any way and um, what was the general no, sentiment no i didn't because ottawa is five hours from where i am for one okay. and two, I have, you know, I have obligations at home, but I did what I could from my home. And I mean, the truckers protest, basically it was very successful because it embarrassed our government for the ridiculous mandates. And it set the stage for the rest of the world in regards to what to do if your government becomes tyrannical like Trudeau. Yes. And then it did ricochet. It did have that ripple effect, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's a, that's a great um a great way of putting it. And yeah, you you've put into words there something that is kind of hard to hard to articulate, but yeah, it the embarrassment that it showed I think was yes. the main thing. I mean, this video yes. when you saw Trudeau kind of just scrambling for ways to insult these protesters, oh, they're racist, oh, they're anti-trans, yes. like, misogynistic, yes. Yeah, he he just is like he just pulled out the kind of woke ideology handbook and was like i'm just gonna throw as much shit as i can and hope that some of it can you imagine being such a clown and going on national tv and calling the truckers protest transphobic yeah i mean it's absolutely bizarre what the hell does that have to do with anything how does what does it have to do with anything yeah i mean that moment makes it sound so ridiculous like how is it he went on national tv and told the the nation that those that didn't get vaccinated were racist. Yeah, yeah. How does that even make sense? But this is the thing. I think that it exposed like several things. And and one of them was that their willingness for things to just not make any sense. I mean, you can just tell that it's like they've got their ideas of how they're going to, you know, discredit people. And even when it's really obvious and, and, you know, just so blatant, Mm -hmm. um, they're still going to go with it. I, I just, I feel like that was one of the many real watershed moments in this where you kind of see the the ugly underbelly of um, people in power and things like this. That was just a moment where I was like, this guy is just completely scrambling and it all comes out, you know, th- him just saying that it was, it was like a, a 30 second clip at best. And that just gave so much away about the kind of the ideology and the way that they try to use these things as a weapon amongst the powerful, you know, to kind of weaponize people's, I guess inherent wanting to be good people or wanting to to kind of feel virtuous. It's like weaponized virtue, right? That's correct. And the thing is, when he says such lunacy on national TV, and and to me as a woman, when he tells me that I'm misogynistic because I'm refusing his product, that that's that's so surreal that it it's almost like you're dumbfounded with such a stupid statement. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You sit back and you're like, wow, like, do I feel secondary embarrassment for him because he said something so stupid or do I become enraged because it's so stupid? 
Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I'm kind of glad for that moment though, because I think that for me, that surely has got to mark peak wokeism. Mm -hmm. Like sometimes you need a kind of, you know, a top signal for something That's right. to, to kind yes, of be yes, like, yes. okay, it's surely going to get more rational from here. And I feel like when he, he made that speech and, you know, just this slew of just nonsense, um, I feel like he's, it, it's like they use the, the final bullets of wokeism in such an obvious yes. way of just trying to trying to just kind of like spray them against a wall. Right. And it was like, surely that's all you've got. Like there is, there is no more that can be, that can be got from this um, angle. Like you're going to have to move on from this now. Well, the silver lining is that it devalued their narrative. Oh, totally. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, they, they basically overplayed their hand in such a ridiculous way. So. Yes, yes, yes. Because they went from calling everybody Nazis for years. Yeah. And when that grew old, because everybody was a Nazi, in their opinion, they labeled everybody a right wing extremist Nazi for a long time. Mm -hmm. That killed the true value of actually of what actually happened during that time in the 30s and 40s. And now they've changed their narrative to racism. And, you know, to me, it's it's just so easy to see. They're very, very predictable because like these elements of psychological warfare, they all have the same tone. They all have the same commonality, which is the narrative that there is an oppressor and the oppressed. It's a division tactic. It works every time and it's getting old. And mm -hmm. when Trudeau did make those comments, I think, you know, like, the, again, the silver lining was people were able to see how ridiculous he sounded like every single time he's accused somebody of being racist in the past just went out the window because he devalued that narrative in such a way from making such a ridiculous statement totally totally so where do you see canada going from here because trudeau's just been voted in either you know genuinely or illicitly i'm not sure what your beliefs are on that but um mm. he's got what another like three to four years now like this seems like such a long time to give a guy who's exposed himself as a dictator. I mean, you can do a lot in four years, you know? I mean, where's Canada going from here? Well, I believe that he's the prize of Klaus Schwab. Klaus Schwab loves him and treats him as his pet. I think that they're in a situation right now where they have to rebrand re really quickly because, you know, in the election in the upcoming three years, the conservative leader, they have to get a World Economic Forum member in. And they've propped up Jean Charest as the conservative leader who is a literal platinum member of the World Economic Forum as a, as a candidate. But they're going to sneak Paul Levere in as the true World Economic Forum candidate um, because it's very obvious that Canada knows that the Liberal and NDP party are entirely compromised by World Economic Forum. But that's the trick. People don't understand that the true issue is the infiltration of the conservatives by the world economic forum who cares about everybody else we already know they are it's the conservative parties that we need to have a very close look at and that again is is what's going to keep this garbage going you know there's never going to be change there will never be anything that the voters want because the narrative is just going to be bounced back and forth from a uniparty because that's what it is a uniparty they're all on the same team this section of the conversation has been censored in order to meet the community guidelines for the full uncensored version of this conversation please check the description for links to censorship free platforms do you not think though that that putting expecting the system like correcting the system to to be the thing that provides meaningful change like i just think it's only going to be within the very narrow boundaries because I think ultimately until people take power into their own hands and and kind of reject these systems entirely and kind of make them obsolete and redundant, I, I just don't think we're going to ever get real meaningful, meaningful change. Meaningful change is when people start to work within their own communities and out the communist infiltration in the school boards and in the police force and in your, with your mayor and all of those other entities that have been heavily, heavily infiltrated. Like we can't ever have change that just comes from the very top for one. And mm -hmm. two, I think that 
the media, we, we need a new media. We need a new media outlet that will provide people the dissenting opinions and actual truth that they've been wanting to hear for many, many years. This section of the conversation has been censored in order to meet the community guidelines. For the full uncensored version of this conversation, please check the description for links to censorship-free platforms. Have you ever considered leaving? Leaving Canada? I want to leave Canada, but I. the problem is I have my parents here and they're aging and to pick them up and put them in another country minus all of their friends and their support and their community and church, et cetera, there's no secondary gain. Like they wouldn't do well. And I have children here too that, you know, I, they don't want to leave and they're too, they, they know that I speak out about certain things, but they try and stay in the background because they just don't want to be, I, they want to be involved, but they, they can't be involved. They know that. And I mean, they're just happy doing their own thing. And I, and that the problem is like, I see the direction of where this country's going and I can, I see how bad it's going to be. And I don't think that there will be real change until there is a significant amount of loss for people to get up and say, okay, I've had enough. We need real change. I can't, I can't take this anymore. Yeah. I mean, I think that that's going to happen though. I think that's going to happen in a lot of places and it already is. I yeah. mean, I'm in Mexico and the number of Canadians that, that are here. You're in Mexico right now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I live in Mexico. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, and there's a lot of Canadians who have come to Mexico. I mean, like so much of the kind of expat community here is is Canadians and they've come here and wow, they, they yeah. have no intention of going back as well. It's not like they're here and they're like, oh yeah, you know, I'll go back when things improve. It's like they have no intention of going back to Canada. I really think that Canada is experiencing the biggest brain train of anywhere because you could say, okay, well, Australia's bad, New Zealand's bad, et cetera. But where do you really go if you're from there? It's not like you can hop on a flight and, you know, really easily get somewhere yeah. they're so far away from everything but yes. you know mexico canada it's not that far the, the flights aren't hugely expensive and no. mexico is very easy to move to and get residency and stuff and yeah i think it's, it's already happened and, and it will continue to happen in my view yeah i i believe so when you said brain drain correct yes because you know this has been happening with the medical community for a very long time here because we have socialized medicine so we have well-trained doctors and what you see is a lot of them graduate and then they'll move to the united states where they're making four or five times the amount that you know in comparison to what like our communist government would pay them here oh that's funny because i know that there's people here who go to canada like nhs doctors here who opt to go to Canada because I think you actually get paid more than they do in, in an NHS in the UK. Well, there you go. And then, and then when you go from Canada and then you go to the States and, and that's where, you know, you make it rich. Right. So yeah, that's, you know, that's the goal. A lot of these people here that were trained in Canada, actually it's cheaper to go to school here. So they come here, they, they become trained, they do their residency, so on and so forth. And then they move back to the States. Right. Right. Nobody wants to work in a communist system unless you have such roots here that it makes it nearly impossible to leave. Yeah. And I think a lot of people are in that, in that position, you know, that they're just not in a position to leave. I don't know. I, I've thought about a lot of the things that you mentioned myself, because even with me leaving, you know, I've got parents back home and stuff. I've got friends there, you know, all the rest of it. But yeah, one of the things that um someone, someone tweeted this out and it, and it really resonated with me was like people at some point need to think about the, the the next legacy rather than kind of servicing the previous one. So essentially meaning like a lot of people will make, make decisions based upon the situation of their, their parents or their, or their extended family, et cetera, rather than thinking what, what world do I want my kids to grow up in? So a lot of people will stay somewhere and then raise kids in an environment that's kind of getting worse and worse. And, you know, I look at the UK and I'm like, would I, would I want to like raise kids there? Ah, I, you know, I, I just think there's no, there's no hope there. You know, the country right. is so in debt. The culture right. is in decline. I just, you know, I yes. mean, it's not that bad compared to other places. It's not as bad as Canada and New Zealand, et cetera, especially on, on the COVID stuff. The UK, you know, was one of the first countries to kind of really actually re-embrace some level of, of freedom. But on every other metric, uh, you know, I, I could see the UK going the way that Canada or New Zealand has gone. Like, it, it, I think it was just a complete fluke that the UK didn't fully embrace those same positions, you know, on being 
extremely anti-free anti-freedom but everything else you know culturally in terms of the amount of debt in the country you know i just you can't you know people the amount that they've got to take out to, to get a house like the household debt levels are crazy it's just like right i don't know i just think it's so hard for people to to live a, a life of prosperity there and it's going to continue to get worse unless the government massively massively shrinks unless you know they embrace um free markets unless the culture has some kind of radical shift i just don't see see it um being a good place to ra- raise the next generation no it won't happen because this communist infiltration has been happening for decades decades and decades and it's the, and the and the point is is that when you capture the academia and the school system you're creating generations of useless idiots right so we see that you know we're 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 in a position where children the way they are today are not how they were 30 years ago the teaching styles today are not what they were 30 years ago and it all starts with education and that's where the culture rots because you have these marxist ideologues as teachers teaching your children these ridiculous fraudulent causes that defy common sense and the problem is these children become so indoctrinated and you and you do this over and over with generations and you have we, and, and the result is unemployment weak armies right you have entitlement children you have children they're anarchists and they turn they they're they're they come out and they hate the system they revolt against the system and you know unless you have drastic changes in the education system and root out all of the communists that are indoctrinating our children there's not going to be change yeah i see what you're saying but when you when you use the word anarchist you're talking about they teach like, your children to hate you your parent their own parents and create a revolution I, I against the family unit against your family against everything and they teach your children to just be hateful beings and the problem is is that this has been happening for decades because the communists know that the only way to take over a country is to collapse the nuclear family and you're watching it happen in real time and you're watching the results of the collapse of the nuclear family happen in real time culture decline everything suffers yeah i mean the thing is when people hear you say that and I have this tendency as well is is I'm like okay well that immediately sounds kind of conspiratorial like these these people who are kind of like planning it in the shadows etc but actually like there are a lot of inherent kind of incentive structures that just make things the way they are right like ultimately it's the incentives are such that these public institutions are going to end up being staffed with people who want more public institutions and more public money spent you know, because that's what they, that's what they do, right? They're going to be naturally um, more critical of private enterprise, et cetera, than the private sector is. And as it grows, it grows stronger and stronger and stronger, right? Because as the, I think in the UK now, the the public sector um, is approaching or may have even gone over 50%. Well, that's just a domino effect because the more people in it, the more people are going to vouch for it and want more and more public sector structures, right? Um, More and more government. So yeah, it's not, um, you know, I just wanted to kind of like point that out that it's not, this isn't like a, cons- a conspiracy view. Like there's these people who are planning it in a top-down way. It's more just like the incentive structures is such that that is the inevitable outcome, right? All you have to do is watch libs of TikTok, right? <laughs> I, I can't bring myself to do that. Well, that's the answer right there, right? Yeah, it's just so cringe, isn't it? Do that over and over and over and over. And what do you think the result is going to be? The real you know, the real silver lining with the lockdown was when the children had to stay at home and the parents were able to view what their teachers were teaching their children. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that's when we saw a parental uprising, especially in the States, when they were able to listen to what some of these children were being taught in class, they were, they were, they were stunned. And you have to remember that some of these parents went into school board meetings to read books from their children's library, but then the school board meeting would stop them because it was too pornographic for the public to hear. Yeah, I heard about that. Right? Let's think about this for a second. 
let's think about what this is doing psychologically to these generations. And, and that answer answers every question that you have brought up. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that we're, we're kind of, maybe this is all tied in as well with like civilization because there seems to be like a civilizational collapse, a collapse of kind of morality and everything. And, you know, I'm just kind of like, it's all happening at once. It's all tied into the same thing, but it's like, you know, the, just the changing of definitions, like the inversion of truth, you know, like kind of immorality being, you know, kind of just accepted and there's no, I don't know. It's all, it's all very weird. We're going through weird times and it's hard to, um, I think that when you start thinking about this long enough, you end up, or at least I end up almost down a kind of religious kind of Path? perspective. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I yes. almost, okay. it feels there's a kind of palpable sense of good and evil going on. But then I'm like, okay, well, am I being too much of a dogmatist looking at things through this lens? Well, I mean, we know that what is happening right now is psychological economical and spiritual yeah right yeah something has happened we know this mm -hmm. and i mean at the end of the day we're you're gonna have to choose a side good or evil there's there's no in the middle at this point you know like if you are the type that wants your children to to learn this garbage that lives of tiktok um, exposes every single day, then that's on you. But nobody wants this cultural rot. And we're fighting a system that is demanding that we accept it. And people just don't have the fortitude and the courage to stand up and speak against it because they don't want to be labeled racist, misogynist, et cetera, because that can collapse your entire livelihood once you're branded that way. Yep. So people just put up with it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. They do what works. Yeah, I agree. I mean, you know, there is a there's a a war on for people's kind of minds, but yeah, I, I yes. keep coming back to it being also a spiritual war. Like the the more that I seem to to dig down into this, it's like I don't know. It's it's almost like I feel like some people when I see certain things or hear certain things and lose lose TikTok is a good example. Some of the stuff I'm just like, man, these people, they need, they need saving. And I'm not even a religious person, right? Like I don't subscribe to any religion, but I look at it and I'm like, yes, yes, these yes. people need to see the light, you know? And I find myself kind of talking in these terms, like, you know, saying things that would sound like what, right, a, right. you know, a, a, a Christian or. I no, guess, but this you know. is the thing, like you care about humanity and you see somebody that is so broken. Mm -hmm. And I mean, you want an explanation just for yourself as to why, you know, something like this happened. And I mean, Marxists and communists are very broken, broken people. And the communist wants nothing more than your children. And so how do they do that? How do they achieve success in that way? Well, they become teachers. That's it. Through academia. They go to university. They're indoctrinated heavily by socialist Marxists. And then they carry that ideology into teacher's college and then into the classroom and the cycle continues. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I didn't feel like, I mean, maybe I was just too young and possibly naive to have noticed it, but I didn't really feel like when I was growing up in school that I had particularly any kind of communist tint on any of that. But for me, it was more when I went into university um, the the yes, universities yes, yes. are bad. I mean, you know, yes, yes, you yes. cannot pass a kind of a liberal arts degree or something I as know. a conservative or libertarian. Like it's just not going to happen. You have to subscribe to some extremely far left ideas. And when I look oh, back on yeah, that, absolutely. oh, it's crazy. I mean, I sometimes I uh, I look back because I've still kept like my essays and stuff. And sometimes I just look at them and I'm like, my God, I, this is a different person writing this. And I was so I was so indoctrinated. Oh, it's funny because I was reading some of my former papers uh, a while ago and, and I was like, yeah. wow, I'm surprised they didn't kick me out. You know, I fought them right from the beginning. Yes. I never, I never bent the knee once, not even once. Oh, didn't never. you? So, so you never no. had a stage of being a kind of um, leftist in any way? No, never. Nope. Oh, not even wow. Once. You nope. really, you really escaped that. That's amazing. Cause um, yeah, I definitely did. For me, my turnaround was was a few years ago it was uh, oh yeah yeah no. i just i discovered bitcoin and it sent me down a different rabbit hole and then that was it i was i was a libertarian oh, okay oh i was fighting i was i was 
displaying abortion victim photography on university campuses over 20 years ago. Oh, wow. God, you really are. Oh, a, yes. A, 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 yes, I was almost arrested. Yes. Yeah. Yes, they didn't like what I was doing. And this was, yes, this was 20 years ago. And I remember saying, you know, if you guys start saying that these images are fake, we'll just sue you. Right, right. Damn. What they do is they show up with a bunch of balloons to try and hide the pictures, right? Unbelievable. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. Wow, that is, that's mad. Yeah. That's mad. And that's, again, that's <laughs> communist Marxist ideology, right? Abortion. Like silencing people and stuff. Up until birth. Oh, yes, yes, yes. But these are the ideologies that they desperately need to protect and abortion oh, is right, one of them. I see. Right, you I know? See. And they will do whatever it takes to protect these coveted ideologies. And what do all of these ideologies have in common, right? And that's where you go into that spiritual, um, like what you called it, a rabbit hole. And, and you start to read and say, okay, I do see a commonality here. And I do believe that these people are really not good people. You have to ask yourself, what type of what type of person wants to make sure that abortion is available up until after a baby's born? It's wild. You have to like who wants this? Yeah, I like the terms you put that in where you said, what are the commonalities between all those things? And then that's when you start getting to the spiritual stuff. That's a really good way of, of yes. describing it. Because that's how I found it, is that there's all of these things, and I'm like, this yeah. is this is wrong, and this is wrong, and this is wrong. And then I go, what's the common theme you know quite often it comes yes. back to ideas of of man thinking he he's god right like a man thinking That's i'm right. going to exert my influence over nature i'm you know all this transhumanism yes. comes into it all this yes. idea that like yes, yes, yes. yeah and then that's where i start down that that spiritual rabbit hole so uh yeah or, or not even spiritual it kind of gets religious at that point i mean I, the, the the spiritual thing is a bit more comes a bit more naturally to me because i've you know i've always been like quite a spiritual person but then once you start getting to a certain level of that i'm like wow this almost sounds like biblical you know i'm actually going to be talking to rickman about this so there's no point in going too far down this this uh this rabbit hole he's gonna he's gonna be talking about the religious angle so um but yeah it's definitely nice. something i'm keen to explore more because there's i don't know even as a non-religious per person like there, there's something there there's some parallels there i think exactly and i think that at the end of this it will be the element of spirituality that people will be desperately seeking because there will be nothing else. And maybe that's the silver lining there. That's right. We're going to see lineups at churches. Yes, I believe so. There will be nothing else for them to, to do, say, go. That will be the rock bottom. And that's what we will see. They will want a miracle. Okay, so that's a really good point to to round up on. So this has been awesome. Thanks so much for, for coming oh, on. Oh, no, thank you so much. Any time. Thank you so much. I promise that next time it, it, it'll be easier. <laughs> oh, yeah, no worries. Yeah, hopefully we get to see your face next time. But yes, yes, before, yes. Uh, before we sign it off, just let people know where they can find you for those who aren't already following you. And then if you just have any kind of final words or things that you want to add to tie things up, that'd be great. Uh, well, I'm, I'm banned everywhere. So the only place you can find me is on Twitter and that's Liz underscore Churchill underscore. Uh, I guess to wrap it up, I would say that don't lose hope. I do believe that there are good people that are, you know, working um, behind the scenes to try and reduce the amount of carnage that we're going to be seeing um, in the upcoming years. I think that, you know, if, if there's one thing that people can do is to help you understand the situation more clearly, if you can look at it through the lens that we're in a war and that we're not in a pandemic, then all the pieces fit nicely together and you have that closure um, because you can see you know, the things that were not so clear a few years ago. And it answers the reasons as to why it is continuing the way it's continuing right now. Right? We're on what another pandemic? Right? Are we? So, yeah, there's a monkeypox pandemic. Oh, the monkeypox thing. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm I'm not sure they're going to be able to kick that one off the ground, but let's let's. I, guess I we'll don't see. think so either. It's too it's too ridiculous. It's too ridiculous. Like nobody's. It's too ridiculous. <laughs> I, they're going to have to come up with something better. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Something probably like AIDS, Ebola, et cetera. Um, 
So, or as Bill Gates says, oh, I'll get the next one will really get people talking. Yeah, sure, sure, Bill. Um, <laughs> but I mean, I think that there's hope and I enc- encourage people to get involved in their community. I encourage people to speak to as many people as possible because now is the time that people are, they want, they want the truth, right? So find a way to speak with people and tell them how you truly feel, you know, talk therapy and politics all in one. That's a great message to end on. So thanks so much, Liz. Okay. Thanks. We'll talk soon. <laughs>